ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to give the commencement address at this college, an institution that has for a century and a half been an inspiring example, not only to the people of Michigan, but to America as a whole. Hillsdale was already flourishing in the days of the Civil War when the college distinguished itself in the fight against slavery. And it is flourishing today when it has led the fight against the new kind of slavery imposed by the state. It is, I have to say, somewhat astonishing to be standing here today addressing a free institution devoted to the ideals of academic life, which has resolutely refused to conform to any purpose other than its own. It is no longer widely assumed that institutions and gatherings are legitimate until they have been subjected to some government program. We live in a world in which minorities impose their will through law and censorship. Of course, they're not the old minorities of landowners and slave drivers. They are minorities that owe their status to the state rather than to society. Liberal professors, lobbyists, tireless agitators determined to impose their values on the rest of us, usually in the name of some other minority to which they do not belong, but whose disadvantages they appropriate as badges of honor. I don't think I need to remind you of the phenomenon or of the damage that it is doing to the American culture of responsibility and enterprise. But maybe it would be appropriate at this happy event to say something about the kind of education that Hillsdale stands for and its utility in the world to which we belong. For it is thanks to institutions like Hillsdale that academic freedom and respect for intellectual tradition still exist in America, even though they are rapidly disappearing elsewhere. The Liberal Arts College is a specifically American institution there are a few private universities scattered around Europe. Oxford and Cambridge are still nominally independent of the British government, though increasingly dependent upon it for funds. But institutions devoted purely to implanting knowledge in young minds, in which curriculum, conduct, and ethos are entirely subordinate to that aim, no longer really exist in Europe. Everywhere we sense the long arm of the state and at the head of that arm, a bureaucracy that has social engineering rather than knowledge as its governing concern. Thanks to the liberal arts tradition, free scholarship has been maintained in America. And I would like to say something today about what that really means. For a long time, we in Europe have been told that the knowledge and skills imparted to our children should be relevant and that the test of a relevant curriculum is that it should benefit the students who are studying it. But when universities were founded, it was with quite another aim in view. They were founded in order to enhance and propagate knowledge. And the knowledge in question was regarded as valuable for its own sake, whether or not it could be put to any immediate use. Knowledge was not a benefit conferred on students, Rather, students were a benefit conferred on knowledge. They were the means whereby knowledge could be passed on, the instrument for transferring to the next generation a precious legacy acquired from the last. That is as it should be, and as it still is, I believe, in an institution like this. I'm not saying that the school is more important than the student. I'm saying that the school and the student must work together to advance a shared aim and that aim is not pleasure or career or social engineering, but knowledge. There are good things that we obtain only if we aim at them and work for them, but there are other good things that we obtain only if we don't aim at them and don't work for them exclusively. Success comes to those who put other values above it, values like honesty, probity, responsibility, and the affections of private life. And one of the values on which success depends is knowledge. Often you will hear it said that our curriculum is antiquated, that the subjects taught are irrelevant, that new skills and new knowledge need to be imparted, and so on. And of course it is true that the knowledge that is stored and taught in universities and colleges must always be updated. 
Indeed, that is one of the functions of an institution like this one, to ensure not just that old knowledge is retained, but also that new knowledge is added. However, you cannot know in advance what will or will not be relevant to the future needs of society, nor can you invent knowledge before you have discovered it. It is only by reflecting on a given store of knowledge and attempting to enlarge and improve it that we can really understand what we are doing when we teach in a college. Here is an example. In the early 19th century, university education in my country, in Britain, was largely centered on classical languages and theology. Many people had difficulty in understanding why the civil service should be recruiting people whose knowledge concerned languages that could not be spoken and worlds that could not be seen. But when, in a fit of absence of mind, the British acquired an empire, it was just those people who had the knowledge required to govern it. Graduates in the old classical curriculum were familiar with pagan myths and tribal societies. They could feel their way into social worlds where the supernatural was inextricably entwined with the natural. They had the discipline needed to pick up languages, whether dead like Sanskrit or living like Hindi or Yoruba. It was British civil servants, not native Indians, who began the movement to revive classical Indian music and who collected and restored so much of the Sanskrit heritage. And thanks to their knowledge, which many people had regarded as entirely irrelevant to the progressive times in which they lived, a mere thousand British civil servants, educated largely in Latin and Greek, were able to govern the entire subcontinent. I could mention other examples. The irrelevant seeming science of formal logic, which grew from abstract questions in philosophy, led at last to the computer revolution. The armchair study of Livy, Tacitus, and Cicero endowed us with the concepts that shaped the American Constitution. But maybe the point does not need insisting on. Knowledge becomes useful to us unpredictably, and it is useful only because it is knowledge rather than opinion or propaganda. Relevance should not be a concern of the true academy, for what is relevant changes from day to day and unpredictably, whereas knowledge is permanent and never loses its worth. But how do we distinguish knowledge from opinion? How in particular do we distinguish the two in those areas like the traditional humanities where there is no scientific method? This question troubled Plato and inspired him to found the academy over two millennia ago. And the question remains with us today. In recent years, we have witnessed a crisis in the humanities that has had serious repercussions, not only in universities, but also in the surrounding culture. Many people have lost confidence in the claim of the traditional humanities to embody knowledge, and have therefore begun to wonder whether it is to anyone's benefit that we go on making a place for these subjects in the academic curriculum. If the only thing you learn from your courses in literature is how to ape the political opinions of the professor, then it could well be that your parents were damn fools to spend the quarter of a million dollars required for your college education. This problem is especially urgent for a college like this one. What, after all, do we mean by the liberal arts if not the study of the many ways in which the human spirit has sought to express and endorse itself in artistic cultural and political tr traditions. And young people come to college both eager to acquire the culture of their community and curious about the culture of everywhere else. For many of them, the three or four years of college are the one occasion in a lifetime to acquire knowledge and insight into the human condition, to become at home in the world of ideas, and to learn that most important of all abilities, which is the ability to read a book. In the light of this, the humanities cannot fail to be of the first importance for an institution like Hillsdale College, since they are the primary way in which an inherited culture is preserved and passed on, and an opening for the mass of young people to the life of the mind. When we look at what is taught in the name of the humanities at many of our universities, the Ivy League colleges included, we find ourselves often both disappointed and alarmed Disappointed at the decline in serious knowledge, 
and at alarmed at what is being put in its place. We have seen the emergence of courses, indeed whole subjects, in which the purpose is not dispassionate inquiry, but ideological conformity. One in particular that, that has swept through academic academies, sorry, has swept through American academies with a speed that is itself a sign of an ideological rather than an intellectual purpose is women's studies which I'm glad to say has no place at Hillsdale College. As Christina Hoff Sommers, uh, Sommers has shown in her many writings, the majority of courses in women's studies are really tests of ideological conformity. It doesn't matter what you know at the end of such a course, but rather what your opinions are on the issues that concern the modern feminist. You have got to subscribe to a raft of political attitudes and to support those attitudes with whatever pseudo-scholarship comes to hand. You have to study our culture, civilization, and history in a state of paranoid suspicion that it was all really a conspiracy against women. And if you diverge from the official doctrine, this is pretty sure to be reflected in your grade. <clears throat> This is not to say that there is no benefit to be gained from studying the way in which the position of women in society has been reflected in art and literature down the centuries. There are interesting intellectual questions here, but the thought that you can gain insight into those questions simply by the study of women and with the ideological blinkers of the modern feminist pinned firmly to your head is not just unlikely. It involves assuming as the premise of your study what ought at best to be a conclusion and one that you should be free to reject. It involves putting the unquestionable in place of the question. The existence of such pseudo-subjects creates a further problem over and above the growing heap of intellectual garbage. For what happens to the graduates that emerge from such a study? What do they go on to do in life? Well, one thing they can do is teach. And that is what they will do if they can. Hence, once a pseudo-subject exists, it will rapidly spread through the educational system, rotting the minds of adolescents and children right down to the very lowest grade in school. That is one reason why hard subjects with real intellectual disciplines attached to them are disappearing from our schools. For society is undersupplied with people able to teach them and oversupplied with people who want to teach something else and whose sights are fixed on the opinions rather than the knowledge of the young. Ideology is one threat to humane education, pseudoscience and pseudo-theory another. For this too is a sign of a loss of confidence. Literature, music, art, history and political science are vehicles of knowledge, but it is not scientific knowledge and cannot be contained in a theory. When people lose sight of this knowledge or lose confidence in the belief that it is really knowledge, rather than the cast off opinions of dead white European males, they look around themselves for some method with which to approach it. Approach it. They bury their confusion under a mound of pseudo technicalities and borrowed jargon and pretend to themselves that they have put what was previously empty speculation on a more scientific or theoretical footing. And very often, the devices that appeal to them are adopted for their subversive potential. The science is chosen in order to destroy the moral credentials of the subject matter, rather than to relate to it as ours. Hence, the absurdist philosophy of deconstruction has swept through humanities departments in America, not because it has any foundation, uh, uh, foundation in truth, but because it promises to debunk whatever it is applied to and can therefore be used to cast off our cultural inheritance and release, re relieve us of the burden of transmitting it. Ideology and pseudoscience have not yet triumphed, and Hillsdale is one inspiring sign of this. This college has stayed true to the belief that the humanities remain central to academic life. Hillsdale reminds us that while young people need factual knowledge, they need moral knowledge too. True humane education involves an education of the sympathies and an imaginative awareness of the human condition in its completeness. It requires an openness to experience that is the very opposite of the ideological dogmatism that is increasingly required of the young. And it is acquired by the long, slow process of critical reflection. 
This process underpins such subjects as art history, English, and musicology. Critical reflection does not ask you to renounce all judgment or opinion, but it asks you to recognize the distinction between informed opinion and mere ideology. It can be imparted only where a firm and enduring curriculum is maintained in being by people whose understanding is constantly refreshed by the study of the enduring monuments of our culture. To define and defend humane education, so understood, is one of the great challenges faced by acad academies in our time. It is thanks to places like Hillsdale that this challenge is still understood and is still being met by so many devoted and responsible teachers. Those who graduate from such a college take with them into the world a body of useful knowledge and an awareness of the real distinctions between knowledge and opinion and between scholarship and ideology. They will serve as guiding lights to those around them and will possess a moral and intellectual inheritance that they can pass on to the generations on whom our future depends. Long may Hillsdale continue the good work of producing those graduates and so pointing the way forward for the Academy as a whole. Thank you. On behalf of the faculty and the Board of Trustees of Hillsdale College, it is my privilege to present to you Roger Scruton, the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Apparently, uh, Professor Scruton was very good on a YouTube video, too. And uh, the senior class officers and I were not, were not incorrect about him. Thank you, Professor, very much. Lawrence and Valerie Bullen hail from Jackson, Michigan, up that way where it's raining. Lawrence is a graduate of Jackson Junior College and the University of Michigan and its law school. He served in the Army, and he practiced law. He has helped to found the Jackson Community College. He was chairman and board member of just about every major charity in that city and indeed in this region, including especially the Jackson Symphony Orchestra, where he first got to know Jim Holloman, and the Foote Memorial Hospital. He has won every award that city has to give. Valerie is a retired German teacher, and she too forms the bedrock of their city and their region. She is an advisor in scholarship administration to the University of Michigan, and she's on half the boards in town. Lawrence is the chairman of the Weatherwax Foundation. They have been generous with the college, especially in the sciences and music and the Hillsdale Academy and the Kirby Center in Washington. Those two have been married nearly 60 years. They have four children and eight grandchildren, and I've known them for 12 years, and I've always found them funny, kind, intelligent, perceptive, full of good advice and also very generous. Please welcome them to the podium. <laughs> On behalf of the faculty and the Board of Trustees of Hillsdale College, it is my privilege to present to you Lawrence and Valerie Bullen, the honorary degree Doctor of Public Service. Jan Sherman Hindler was born in New York City. She attended Skidmore and is a graduate of Hunter College in Manhattan. 
She holds the master's degree in public administration from the American University in Washington. She has consulted with the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and managed at the accounting firm Pete Marwick. With her husband, Howard, she has a keen interest in art and music. Howard also was born in New York. He graduated from Columbia and from the New York College of Dentistry. He was a captain in the United States Army and he was stationed in Washington, D.C. when he had the good fortune to meet Jan. He practiced dentistry and served on the faculty of the Howard University College of Dentistry. Howard and Jan will reach their 50th wedding anniversary this July. Howard is fully aware of the massive good fortune that has come upon him. They moved to the warm in Phoenix and in Santa Fe, and they spend their time there now. They support the arts and teach about them to anyone who has the luck to know their company. They have a special interest in contemporary art, and Howard is on the board of the Phoenix Art Museum. They are life members of the President's Club. If you go to Santa Fe, I'm now on behalf of them and without their permission to ask every one of you, to invite every one of you to go have dinner with them, because there isn't any better fun to be had on the face of the earth. Please come forward, Howard and Jan. On behalf of the faculty and the Board of Trustees of Hillsdale College, it is my privilege to present to you Howard and Jan Hindler, the honorary degree Doctor of Public Service. Howard just said, when I said that's 4,000 dinner guests, he just replied, I can't wait. So it's confirmed now. <laughs> you will see in your program a description of the life of, and works of Dawn Tibbetts Potter. She is a funny, generous, and intelligent woman. She's just a complete hoot. And she couldn't be here, I'm sorry. So alas, you do not get to meet her. But we will carry her degree to her in California. Our senior class president is uh, Dina Farhat. She is just like all the other officers of the senior class, uh, well prepared to the point of annoyance, intelligence, grateful, constantly pleasant, inspiring to know. Even that grows a little annoying. She has so much of all that. She'll be attending Michigan State to study biology while she applies for graduate school. She was the homecoming queen and not on looks alone. She is a moving force in Chi Omega, and everyone loves her. Dina Farhat. Dr. Arn, members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished guests, fellow graduates, faculty, staff, family, and friends, it is my honor to stand before you today on this momentous occasion. If I may speak on behalf of my classmates, I must admit the last few weeks have been quite chaotic. We've experienced many laughs. We've attended our last convocation, played in our last game, or had our last recital. We've swiped into Saga for the last time, left our mark on our senior sidewalk, we've submitted our theses, had our last chance for a ring before spring, and for the, but most importantly, for many of us, it was the last time we spent frantic hours calculating the grades needed on finals to get an A in the class. Now, as it is almost time to say our last goodbyes, I cannot help but look back at the beginning of this journey. I remember it only as if it were yesterday, that beautiful sunny Sunday August afternoon sitting in the very seats you're seated in now. It was the day of freshman convocation. Much like today, it was a day of mixed emotions, the excitement of beginning a new chapter, the nervousness of leaving everyone and everything familiar behind, 
and the challenge of beginning something difficult. However, emotions and excitement aside, there's been one moment that has resonated with me since that day. As Dr. Arn was addressing our class for the first time, he stopped to make a note to our parents. He said, at some point, your son or daughter will say to you, I'm excited to go home. However, by home, they will mean Hillsdale. At that moment, I was, I admit, a bit skeptical. I thought, how is it possible for this little town in the middle of nowhere or my barren dorm room to become home? Needless to say, standing before you now, I find no better way to describe it. I know of no other place in which people who were once strangers not only became friends, but family. A place where professors welcome you not only into the classroom, but also their homes. A place where the administration gives not only a friendly wave, but knows your name and the fact that you snuck into the library last night. A place that has led us on a path to our passions, though not always the easiest. A place where the weather is always changing, but the smiles and support are unwavering. A place where strength really does rejoice in the challenge. A place where four years just doesn't seem like enough. As we now leave this home to embark on a new journey, it is our duty to take the knowledge and principles that have been instilled within us to go forth and be a light upon men. Regardless of whether we make that $25 donation or not, Hillsdale will always be home to us. We have many to thank for today. Our parents, who have allowed us room to grow and a permanent place to call home, and our faculty for inviting us into their homes and making our cares theirs. I would like to thank each member of the class of 2012. Standing before you today, I am humbled by the chance to represent so many that have done so much. May God bless you in all that you do. Till we meet again neath banners of white and blue, I wish you all the best. Congratulations, class of 2012.
Inspiring Hillsdale College Chamber Choir under the direction of James Holloman and accompanied by Deborah Wise. I appeal to the faculty that looked like a whole lot of seniors in that group. Is there any way yet to flunk them out so they can come back next year? Will the graduating class of 2012 please rise? <laughs> Upon the recommendation of the faculty of Hillsdale College and, the, and with the authority vested in me by its board of trustees, I co uh, confer upon each of you the degree for which you have been a candidate and admit you to all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities to which you are entitled. Please be seated. Dr. Marino, Dean of Faculty, will you proceed? Will the candidates in accounting please come forward? Dr. Arn, Dr. Arn, the conferring of degrees is complete. On behalf of the Hillsdale College Board of Trustees, I congratulate the students of the class of 2012. I also thank the parents, extended families, and friends who are here today and for your support of Hillsdale College over these past four years. Your role is never far from our minds, and we are grateful for it. This day is always a special one for the Board of Trustees. It is great to be on campus and to see the results of your four years of hard work. Many of us have watched our own children cross this very stage. Some of us have crossed it ourselves. I wish each of you the best, all the best, as you go from this place to cultivate your education, careers, families, and businesses. I hope that you will return often to your alma mater, or as your class president so eloquently put it, your home. Congratulations. God bless. As no doubt you can see, we are so very proud of our graduating seniors, graduated, seniors, I should say. A few housekeeping notes in just a minute. A reception in honor of our graduates will begin in the Grucock Student Union, which is directly behind us. 
but first, I ask all of you to please stand. In just a moment, uh, we will join with the choir in singing the alma mater. Uh, please do remain in your seats until the procession has passed. But before we begin with the alma mater, I can say this to our uh, seniors, hats off to you. It's a tough act to follow. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and evermore. Amen.